All right, so good morning. So now we're here with our famous NBA all-time star, Clay Johnson in Kansas City. And he got his 450 SEL uh, model year 80. It was manufactured November 1979 here. And we will be getting into the car in a minute. And I wanted to have Clay introduce himself to all of you guys you see how tall he is <laughs> this is why i don't play basketball <laughs> and i sucked at soccer too because i got short feet <laughs> so clay now it's all you tell oh. us i know that you didn't play for the harlem globe Trotters. no oh, not uh, the harlem globe, globe Trotters. Trotters. I actually i played with the los angeles lakers all right <laughs> a lot of people know us by the showtime area uh, we we just actually we just had a reunion all right. the Showtime reunion Lakers in Maui. So that's what my claim is. Maui, to huh? Maui, a Beautiful Hawaii. Hawaii yes. Yeah. We're over there a week, actually. Magic yeah. Johnson is the reason why we call Showtime, Showtime. And, all right. So I was just a part, you know, just glad to be a part of it. If they say if you're part of it, then you Showtime too. Yeah. And I feel really privileged because Clay is one of my subscribers on my YouTube channel. Yeah. See, you're in good company here if you subscribe to my channel. And Clay contacted me early this year, and I had uh, announced it in a video, I think it was back in January or uh, February, that we would be working on his 450 SEL. And I went out here. He lives in Kansas City, Missouri, and I had a, like a 20-minute drive or so. And we started looking at it, and it was freezing cold, I think. Oh, yeah, it, it was, was so 20, cold. 20 degrees Fahrenheit out it there. It was really, really cold. cold. Yeah. And we did a little bit of stuff, and then we kept talking forwards and backwards, and we had some other things. So today is the day we actually going to go into the car, and we're going to show you all of the stuff that we have been finding and what we're intending to fix here to get his 450 SEL back to work. Okay, so this is now Clay's 450 SEL, model year 80, built in November 1979. And uh, let's see, it got the newer version already with the frequency valve and the fuel distributor with frequency valve installed. He does not have the uh, throttle switch on the throttle body housing on this one here. And he has no safety switch on the intake system for the uh, fuel pump relay. He has the transistorized ignition in there. And I tested already the vacuum advance here. We will show that in a little while. You know, this works quite well. And we took off the covers. And what we can see here is we can see quite some slack in the chain. You can see it here. And there's a couple things I wanted to point out. The camshafts are still looking good. Oh, and by the way, the car got about 108,000 original miles. And this is typical for those cars is between any of these V8s, no matter which one you got from the 1970s on all the way up to 92, um, you're gonna have a problem with the chains at around 100,000 miles. And here we got the, now that's what I wanted to throw in. So here we got actually the, they had three versions of the oil tensioner. And the oil tensioner in here, this is the lower part you see back down all the way down here. This is the one with the three bolts, which has the exhaust return going in there. This is where they used to blow in the early EGR valves. This is how this was disposed of. And um, these oil tensioners, after all of these years, or when they're new, is you have to take them out or a new one, you put them into a bucket with this part here, since they're angled in a, uh, in a, I think, 35 degree angle. They don't come out straight. They go in into an angle like this, oops, like this up. And you put them into a container filled with fresh oil. And uh, that the tip, or basically the piston, stands up straight. It's basically pointing up straight. And uh, that all has to be submerged in fresh oil. And then you start plunging, pushing the plunger down 
uh, several times until you feel the resistance increasing to preload these chain tensioners with oil, with fresh oil. And as more oil you get in there when that is working right, you will probably not be able to push the plunger in with your finger anymore. It has a preload, a spring in there, which is just some resistance to push that plunger out until it has been loaded with um, with fresh oil. So these, that is really, really important. Never put in one of these um, chain tensioners without preloading them with oil. They have to be under full pressure when they're installed. And that's why that is so difficult to get them in with the short screws. But we will show this to you on how this is done when we get to this. So we're going to take this oil ten uh, uh, chain tensioner off and we're going to clean it out because you can see is that he has some oil residue, dried out oil as residue. This is normal when a car sits for a long time and the oil change have not been done, say, like every three or 5,000 miles. Now, back to his chain. On the oil tube feeding line here, this side was good. It was still pretty um, uh, firm in place. But on the left bank, it popped when I pulled it out. It was so simple. Uh, it came right out here. As always, it is always the left wheel um, camshaft bearing housing, which uh, where they pop out, where they dry out first. This side here, I was able to pull out by hand. On the other side, on the right hand side, we had to pull it out with the screwdriver. And this here, you will see something here. This is something where Clay got really, really lucky last year when he got the car. You see this here? And you think, well, doesn't look too bad. Well, if you know anything about these engines, then you know that they are not supposed to be doing this. And it should look like more on this side. See, this is where it just goes left to right, but you cannot move it forwards and backwards. Well, after we took, we took, when it was that cold in February, I think it was, right, Clay? Right, right. We took off only the right side um, camshaft cover because it was too cold. And we postponed this here, taking this one off, uh, until today. Today we got like 60 degrees. It's nice and not too hot and not too cold. We didn't want to do it in the summer in 100 degree weather out here either. Mm -hmm. So we waited until now. And I take the cover off and the first thing I see laying in here is the lower part of this guide rail. And now Clay is going to tell us on how he actually found out that something was right here and turned off the engine and hasn't turned it on since, basically. Right. You want to go ahead, Clay, and tell us it? Well, I, I took it to a shop. This guy evidently didn't know what he was doing. He, he did the uh, fuel distributor. Uh, he put it on. I actually tried to rebuild it myself, but I don't know what he did, but gas was actually coming out of the exhaust mm -hmm. when the car was running. But if, if it wasn't running, no gas, but it was running and talked to Peter. He said, if it's gas coming up, it could ruin your, your pistons and all that stuff with the gas actually running through it. So after I talked to him, I shut it off and I never ran it again. <laughs> yeah, and I didn't know when he said the gas, I didn't know that we would run into this kind of issue. Of course, if one someone tells you that the engine has 100,000 miles, at that point, the first thing you have to look at on these engines is the chain and the oil guide tubes in here and the chain guides as well and your chain tensioner. These are the most critical ones. So what we're going to have to do now, of course, is we have to remove the uh, power steering pump and the alternator 
to get to the pins and then we're gonna replace this here. This probably won't be happening today. Our goal here today was to get a general assessment now, a full assessment, which we couldn't do in January or February because of the temperatures. And we want to test the uh, injectors, pressure test them. I did get, I brought with me my tools. So I got a couple vacuum gauges here with me just to um, see, you know, where we are if we had something. And I got Kent Berksmas, Mercedes Source, a uh, famous injector tester with me. So we're going to be testing all of his eight injectors. And then on my next visit, I will bring the bore scope with me, which is, might be next, no, not next weekend, but sometimes next week or after next week. Um, and we're going to take a look at the piston. What we're probably also going to do is um, we're going to carefully crank over. I did bring the tool with me to take out the rocker arms and so to close off the valves and then we're just going to rotate the engine over just to get a feel on uh, if there's anything stuck in there if we have any resistance and we're going to do this manually do you have a 27 nut because I left that at home too uh, socket yeah socket the big one for the uh, crankshaft have. Yeah, all right, so then we can probably turn it over. I will make several uh, segments of this video as we go along, and we're going to document this, so this way you can follow this with us. Or oh, the other thing is, if you take, he took the bridge out already, that was one of my uh, recommendations to clean this up, and we got this sitting here in his garage, and we got already the lower unit here, the intake unit, cleaned out and uh, clay put already the new donuts on here and we cleaned up the upper unit and there's a couple issues is that the uh, rubber mounts for the fuel distributor system you see this is the old style which has the metal casting boot on it and that is still good it is not broken it is not cracked they tend to crack after some time and Mercedes-Benz no longer has those. So what they do is they sell you the boot and then they have a metal aluminum casting strip ring which goes around this here to secure the boot into place in uh, replacement of this here which has these threaded parts on it to clamp this in. If you have a newer one, you know this. And what happened here is the, the mounts actually broke off and we have to find the holes. We have to basically tap this out and then turn the, do the reverse thread on those and probably replace all four of them. This is something we have to do. There's a hole in here, a threaded hole and a threaded hole underneath here. We have to get them going to properly install his fuel distributor again. And then we'll assemble the upper intake manifold, which came out really nice. He cleaned it up nicely. And uh, then we can put this back together and then reinstall this. This was then after my first suggestion when I looked at that engine in January. And I had told him that we probably will have to replace the chain uh, without having seen actually the damage. I looked at the guide rails on this side here back in January, and I figured with the slack we have here that uh, we're going to have a worn engine, uh, worn chain. And I didn't think that they were broke yet, but since we haven't cranked it over, we didn't do any more damage. This is actually the first engine I have seen where this part has only broken off. This is how they shear off. And you can see it was still running when it happened because it kind of grinded itself here on the side. But normally what happens is they get sucked in the end. The movement is up. It is a clockwise direction rotation. So this part, when it falls in here, in between, it gets sucked down. And on the lowest uh, uh, pulley wheel, what do you call it, uh, sprocket, on the lowest sprocket, on the camshaft, this thing gets pulverized. And then the remaining little bits and pieces wind up in the oil pan. 
and they get then sucked into the oil pump strainer. This is what I had on my car. My car's over there. You can see it. I drove it since you hadn't seen it in a while. And we will get his car back into the running the way my car's running. So he can drive another 200,000 miles. And this is the time when you were with the uh, Lakers. Lakers. That's right. So this is why this car is so important to him, the year, the time, and everything else. It brings back the time of the Lakers and everything else. And maybe we can get uh, magic out here. Right. Yeah, we we'll give him a right. But he has to pay us. Yeah. He can no right for free. You don't have to pay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I will add another segment here at the next step. Is I think we're going to do, we're going to take the spark plugs out. And so we don't have any compression in there. On my next visit, we're going to do the compression check. I will bring the compression tester with me. And today, after the spark plugs, we're going to take out the injectors. And that's the things we will test today to see where we are with the injectors. And that will be the next segment of this video. Okay, go ahead. All right, we're going to explain now real quick on how the vacuum act vents actually works on the distributor of this system with the transistorized um, ignition system. This was the first version Mercedes-Benz had in these cars and basically we have an inductive pickup here which is uh, installed as a in, uh, replacement of points contacts basically and you can see this here one two three four five six seven eight points and that when that rotates every time it comes by, it causes an inductive signal, so you get eight signals out to the transistor unit, which then fires this up and also sends the signal to the RPM gauge. This was the first version where they used this. And the vacuum goes in two directions. You will see this, it goes now into the counterclockwise direction, advancing it, and then you can also retard it in the other direction. There we go. So retard, advance, retard and advance, and they have a switch over valve for this. This is basically on how this system works. If you work on a car like this, this is one of the first things you will have to test and see if your vacuum element, the membrane or the diaphragm in here is still good. They have to hold the vacuum. Uh, that means if you have any if you just supply a vacuum to it, it needs to stay steady, which is the case here. If this leaks, then you have to replace the, the vacuum advance unit that is mounted on here with two screws, just to show you this. It has to freely rotate this outer ring and it has to hold the vacuum. That is important. Um, yeah, that's what we wanted to do here. The next thing is we have already removed the alternator to get to the two pins here for this guide terminal. I believe that the pin for the chain, uh, for the tensioner guide is down here underneath here. And we're gonna take now off the power steering pump so we can access the pins for these two guide rails here. And then we will check back with you, okay. Okay, so here we're back and uh, Clay is going to explain now to us the timing marks. Are you ready for this, Clay? <laughs> He's just smiling. Well, the timing marks... <laughs> uh, Let me show you this. This represents top dead center. As we can see, this is not top dead center because the, train, the, the chain actually stretched. And we don't have the other rail over here to take up the slack. Wiggle on it again. I missed that part on the rail. Yeah. And that's all I can tell you. Okay. <laughs> and you can see this. Our timing is off right now by approximately 7 degrees, 8 degrees, I would say. And uh, we rotated it over the 0 degree mark and it jumped basically on us because there's no enough, not enough tension anymore in the chain, we got too much slack. Normally, when we rotate this into position, the uh, crankshaft would come to a stop, top that center at zero degrees, which will then align the left-hand camshaft to zero mark, and it would move this here 
over about 70 degrees before the uh, after top dead center. So the right rail is basically off. If the chain jumps a tooth on the sprockets, you're going to be off by 14 degrees. So we know since we're off only by 7 degrees, this is caused by the broken guide rail, um, the slack in the chain itself or this chain stretch, and then the chain tensioner is probably pretty gummed up and we have to see if we can clean this out. Now this is the version where they actually blowing the exhaust in. This was the old EGR or the first EGR type uh, valve system they had for this and that was fed into the entire oil pan, the exhaust gas. This is how crazy this is. Uh, with the timing chain tensioner together. There's three different versions of this and you really have to get the manuals in order to see this. But the good news is, and this is why we primarily checked this, was that we have no jumping of teeth, which means none of the valves and none of the pistons and uh, connecting rods or anything else inside the engine got damaged. The engine itself turns over freely, but of course the the camshaft, the left camshaft, they all will pull over uh, into the clockwise direction because of that slack in the chain we got now. And we will fix this. So we need a new chain. We have to rework and overhaul the chain tensioner to make sure that that is properly filled with clean oil. And um, then we have to remove the guide rails and also put a new chain tensioner guide rail in there. And the next thing we're going to do, Clay and I now, and that probably is going to conclude it for today, is we're going to pull out the injectors and we're going to do a injector test on them with Kent Berksmer's, uh famous, world-famous injector tester. And we're going to pump some diesel through it. Otherwise, there was no surprises. We took out the distributor. It made it easier to remove the old-style a uh, steering pump plate or holder on their bracket that was easier to get out and so we got this all prepped now now it is just basically getting parts and then reassemble how do they say this uh, reassembly is the reversal of the disassembly or something like this yeah straightforward anyway we will be checking in here after our injector test all right, now we have here the conclusion for today's video. We got all eight uh, injectors tested. And as Clay had stated earlier today, you want to say it, we had a leaking. We had leaking coming out of the exhaust. Gas, straight yeah. gas. And we actually found the bad boy, which was on cylinder number four. Right wheel, yeah. all the one in the back, yeah. And this is what this looks like it when you do this. And then it's starting to drop off. And eventually, over time, you will see it is dripping. It's gonna bleed completely down, which is gonna take probably a minute or so. It will lose complete pressure. It just does not hold it at all. And, uh, it will drop all the way down to, I think we had a 2 PSI when we first tested it, yeah. So, and of course they should be staying closed at about 50. I think if we may work this with the diesel here a little bit more, see this how this actually opens the, the position here. Now it opens at the 30s. And then it will drop. And this tester here is from Kent Berksma from Mercedes Sources, you can see. Now I'm making unpaid advertising because Kent took my money. If you watch this, Kent, well, I hope you enjoy your retirement. I really didn't want to pay for it, mm. but you got me anyway. And Clay is happy that I paid the money. <laughs> <laughs> and we're going to sell, we're going to send Magic Johnson the bill for send it, right? Bill. We're going to send Magic the bill for Magic, it. Magic, you out there listening. Yeah. All right. So we're going to say goodbye. And then we see you the next time on Clay, Clay's car. And we will keep working on it. Have a good evening.